Yeah, we're going to think about Psalm 51, which is the prayer that David says after Nathan has come to him and convicted him of his sin. And he wants to, uh, you know, repent, and he does repent very deeply. So we're going to go through Psalm 51, but first of all, we'll go through our prayer requests. Now, there's uh, getting to be a lot of us, and um, I can't guarantee I remember everybody's. You know that will not be purposeful, uh, and the Lord, of course, is aware of all of that. <clears throat> Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the Lord Jesus and for the amazing nature of forgiveness that there is in him. We thank you, Father, for him, and we pray that we may be absolutely committed to him and to his work and to his ways while we have any being in this world. And to praise you from the bottom of our hearts for all you have done for us and for the world in him. We pray as we wait for his coming that you will help us to be lights in this darkness. We pray for the work of Emmy and John Chow and Phil, Phil and Miriam, where they are in Australia. We pray for Mark and in his journeys and all those doing journeys to baptize people. And we pray, Father, for the folks hoping to be baptized here in Oxford and London uh, over the weekend. We ask, Father, that you will above all send the Lord Jesus soon, because that is what we want. When at last, you know, Father, we see through a glass darkly, and we want to see face to face, and to no longer be in the flesh, but to be in the spirit. We pray for Elia as he tries to witness to Muslims in his particular area. And we pray for Audrey's daughter on her journey to Townsville. And again, that even through that, you will work possibly some way to bring her to you. And we we just pray, Father, that you be with all the Iranians that Carol and others are working with, that you will help all of them in this difficult situation that they're now in with accommodation. And in fact, Father, help all of us, none of us to get distracted, none of us to get distracted and to keep our focus on you, whatever happens, and not to live in a sort of crisis emergency mentality day by day, but to have our core being rooted in you. We pray for our families. We pray for those of our families we would dearly like to either return to you or to come to you. And we think of uh, Dan Mui and her request for, for wisdom and Kossam also. We pray that you'll Give us that wisdom. We pray for Louisa's son, Simon, that he will be converted to you. And for Louisa getting a passport as she, she tries to serve you more. And we pray for your blessing, particularly on, on that. And we pray for Raquel with her, her leg. And we pray that for all of us, as Phil said, that we, we, we might, as it were, walk the talk. And that these wonderful ideas that we have in our hearts, that we might live them, we might feel them, we might act them, we might be them in this world. And we pray for Jen and her family and her witness there and for, for Sayedi and her, her, her family and her children. And especially for her sister in hospital at the moment. And we thank you. She's feeling a bit better. We pray, Father, that you bless that situation and, and fill them all with your spirit and with your healing and blessing on that on that dear family. So, Father, open our eyes to your word. That's why we're here. And we attentively, as it were, listen, like Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, for his sake. Amen. Okay, so David has sinned. I suggest you might like to have Psalm 51 open in front of you on your phone or whatever. David sinned. He sinned pretty badly. I mean, he has been told, you have despised the word of the Lord. Well, that was the presumptuous sin, the sin of presumption for which there was no forgiveness. And that was the reason why King Saul had been rejected before David, because he also rejected the word of the Lord. And David has committed adultery in a fairly you know, bad way. I mean, he had loads of wives, but he sees his next-door neighbor, a girl next door, and she's attractive, so he goes and takes her, sleeps with her, and then arranges for her husband to be murdered, along with a, a bunch of other loyal soldiers of his, to try to cover it up. He's trying to do it all secretly. And 
then Nathan comes to him after the child is born and confronts him. And he says in 2 Samuel 12, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, your sin has been put away by the Lord. When you read 2 Samuel 12, it seems just too easy. You do these major sins, adultery, multiple murder, despising the word of the Lord, presumptuous sin. And uh, all you've got to do is say, oh, yeah, I've sinned. And God says, oh, it's OK. All dealt with, mate, you know, play on. And it, it reading 2 Samuel 12, it seems so simple. But when you come and read the Psalms that David wrote, 32, 51, 38, you see that, oh, no, it was not just that simple. There is all this depth of feeling in David. And you wonder why that is. Well, one simple observation is that you're not going to understand the Bible unless you read the whole Bible. You just read those words in 2 Samuel 12 and you would think that, oh, yeah, you can do adultery and murder. All you've got to do is just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I sinned. OK, and God says, oh, don't worry, mate, you know, you're good. And no, but then you you wonder why it is like that. And I think it is set up like that because on one hand, yes, it is as simple as is written in 2 Samuel 12, that we sin, we confess, and God will forgive. And at times like that, it's easy to get into overthinking and overanalysis to the point you miss that simple truth. And yet, on the other hand, we have no entitlement to his grace. We deserve death. Wages of sin is death. We've all sinned, so we shouldn't be alive. And every heartbeat is of his grace, absolutely. So this is the, the psalm by David, verse 1, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your grace. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Nearly all the language that you've got in, in this psalm is later in the Bible applied to every single one of us. Now, in Acts 3, there's Peter preaching the gospel, and he says, repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So he's saying, look, all of us who come to baptism into the Lord Jesus are in the position of David. And we may say, yeah, well, I didn't commit adultery, I didn't commit murder. I didn't, you know, did I do the presumptuous sin? No. But the thing is, this is the key, you see, to what degree we humble ourselves and recognize the real import of our sins, past, present, and probably future. And once you do, then you can get into the huge blessing that that he's talking about here. And he's driven, isn't he, to grace because he should die. And as he's going to say, there's no sacrifice or else I would give it. Well, he says, according to the multitude of your tender mercies or your your great mercies, please blot out my transgressions. Well, he does remember this because later on he's he's given a choice as to what punishment he wants to have for numbering israel and he says let me fall into the lord's hands because his mercies are great or multitudinous if you like so yeah he he did on one hand remember this huge grace and it stuck with him all his life but earlier he's written psalms that say things like this and i'll read psalm 5 verse 10 Hold them guilty, O God, talking about his enemies. Let them fall, thrust them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they've rebelled against you. Well, now it's David's turn. He needs God's, you know, the multitude of God's grace for the multitude of his transgressions. He has rebelled against God. And I think that what that shows is that in the bigger picture, God was using David's sin to try to correct his judgmental attitude against others. And whether God, if you like, totally succeeded, I don't know, because some of the later Psalms, I'm afraid, continue to talk like this, especially at the time of Absalom's rebellion, etc., so, 
God is trying to, not to bring us down in a nasty sense, but he's trying to humble us. And he's very gentle in the way he does it. He's trying to help us to see the import of human failure, human sin. Well, all the way through, as I say, every phrase in this psalm is, is used somewhere later in the Bible. Because we are all in David's position. And Isaiah 43, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers them no more. Like, come on, Judah, repent. Because God blots out, he remembers no more your sin. And he says, verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. When we were looking at the sin of David with Bathsheba, we talked about uh, the translation of that whole thing about he he sees Bathsheba um, when she's washing. Uh, he takes her, he lays with her. She was cleansed from her impurity and she went to her house. And I mentioned that the Septuagint, and it seems to me the Greek, suggest that the sequence was they slept together and in obedience to the law of Moses, after sex, a woman had to wash, possibly David as well. They had sex, they wash at David's place, and she goes home. Well, now he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He realizes that all that ritual stuff was just nothing. And wash me thoroughly. This is the idea, uh, uh, not of rinsing. Just, oh, I've, I've stained my my precious favourite jumper, so I better just rinse it, rub it off. The word literally means to tread, to tread out, because the dyer or the fuller would stamp on and tread out a, a, a garment that had a stain on to get rid of it. And so this is how the word is used, and I'll read you from Micah chapter 7, verse 19. He will tread our sins underfoot and cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So he saw that he was deeply stained and he needed God to tread this out, to totally get rid of it. And I want to suggest that the, the sort of forgiveness that God gives, the sort of cleansing is beyond any forgiveness that man can give. And this is why it's a little bit difficult to get, get a handle on it, because all our experience of forgiveness from each other, from family members, and all the forgiveness that we've given to other people is a case of play on, really. Okay, I will not hold it against you. Right, let's just go on. And if you do something wrong against somebody and they, they say, yeah, look, honestly, it says you're good, you're forgiven. Yeah, OK, well, thank you. But then I'm still struggling in my conscience before God over it. You and your forgiveness of me cannot affect my conscience before God. And the, ex the experience of God's forgiveness is different because he can actually obliterate sin. And no human forgiveness can do that. And David rejoices in this in a number of the Psalms. He talks about God's plenteous redemption. Same word, this thorough uh, washing that he talks about here in verse 2. Come and repent, Isaiah 55, and God will abundantly pardon. Not just pardon, but abundantly pardon. So... David wants the stain of this sin removed. Well, it was never removed in a social sense because all Israel knew about it, and he goes on living with the consequences of it for the rest of his life with the rebellions of his family, etc. And so the stain was only removed in a deeply internal sense. And later on, we're going to read, um, he, he says, <clears throat> Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Well, this is whiter than white. How can you get, as it were, whiter than white? 
I suggest that this is only done by God. Um, you see, verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Isaiah talks about that when he says, Although your sins are as scarlet, if you put them in the red blood of, as it were, Jesus, you come out white, whiter than snow. And that's the great paradox, that you don't use a red liquid to make anything white, but God does. And that, of course, requires trust. Am I going to uh, dye my black jumper, this bit of the black jumper, white? Well, I don't go and put it in a red dye. That's counterintuitive. But that's what we're asked to do. And this is the whole trust aspect to this experience. Now, when the Lord was transfigured, his garments appeared whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. So, again, the idea is that you can only get this experience if you are in the Lord Jesus, then God will see you as if you are whiter than snow. So as I say, this is a forgiveness, that the nature of this forgiveness, the quality of this forgiveness is different to any quality of forgiveness that we've ever experienced from human beings. So he says, verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is constantly before me. Well, in another of the Bathsheba Psalms, Psalm 38, he says, uh, my sorrow is continually before me. Yeah, he says, my sin is continually before me. So sorrow and sin are put in parallel. And there's the thing, I mean, do we really sorrow for our sin? You, you may... Do something which at the time appalls you. How, Duncan, could you have said that or done that? But I'm afraid the real sorrow we have about it tends to dilute over time. Or maybe you start to live like that. And you get no more than a vague little tickle of conscience. This is the reality of spiritual life. And I think we're going to see as time goes on in this psalm and generally with David that I'm afraid that is the lesson from him, that he somehow uh, diminished the whole thing. Anyway, he, he <clears throat> there is this parallel, as I say, between sin and sorrow. My sorrow is continually before me. My sin is continually before me. And that's the challenge, you know, if we want to be forgiven. I mean, are you sorry? Do you have that sense of deep sorrow and disappointment in yourself? Um, and when all around you, you're being told, oh, you're awesome, you know, you're awesome. And yes, people say, oh, I don't want to go to church. When all, you, all they do is point the finger and say, oh, you miserable sinner. Well, I know what they're saying. I mean, if you leave it at that, well, yes, <laughs> it's not a great message, is it? But by the same token, you can only get that feeling of, wow, I am whiter than white in God's eyes. Wow, I'm so clean before him. Wow. Oh, thank you. I've got this freedom of spirit. Yeah, you, you can only get to that if, if, first of all, you are convicted of your sin. And, and so to say, oh, we don't want to hear anything about conviction of sin. Well, then you're missing the point. I'm afraid of the good news. So verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, that you may be proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Now this is a difficult verse to understand. Against you and you only have I sinned. Well, you could say, well, he didn't sin against, uh, against Uriah because, well, Uriah was dead. And you could say, well, he didn't really sin against uh, Bathsheba because she, it seems to me, uh, gave him the come on, and, um, well, there we are. So, yeah. But this verse, however, these words, against you and you only have I sinned, this is one of a number of times in the psalm where I raise my eyebrows, and I think, David, you are very repentant, and I take my cap off to you for your humility and your repentance, but... Some of the things you say would imply to me that you are still 
just a little one or two percent self-justifying and not quite seeing the full dimension of your sins. Because he had sinned against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against the families of those other soldiers he got killed to cover the death of Uriah. He had sinned against all Israel. If you imagine a situation today where a president or a king uh, did something like David had done, well, they would be expected to apologize because they have done wrong to the whole nation. They've done wrong to this person, that person, and well, it's up to public opinion whether they want to forgive or not. But at least you want some recognition. And I wonder how Bathsheba's family and the families and Uriah's family, and the families of the soldiers who were killed to cover Uriah's death, I wonder how they thought, how they felt when they when they heard this, against you, you only have I sinned. I mean, if I were them, I'd been putting my hand up and say, yeah, not only, mate, <laughs> us too, me too. I wonder how they felt when they heard that. And, of course, Bathsheba's grandfather, Ahithophel, does later betray David and rebel against him. And so he didn't take this too well, did he? And then David says, I, I've done this sin and done what is evil in your sight. Well, that's good, David, because he recognizes that God saw. When he had tried all he could to hide what he did by inviting Uriah back from the battlefront to try to get him to sleep with Bathsheba so it looked like the child was going to be Uriah's, getting Uriah drunk, and getting him, trying to get him to do this, sending all these messengers to, with messages about this, that and the other, writing a closed letter to Joab to kill Uriah and, so that Uriah had to carry it but supposedly didn't know what was in the letter. Yeah, he recognizes, yeah, I, I did it all secretly, but how stupid you were looking at me all the time. He says, I've done what is evil in your sight, that you may be proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Yes, these verses are quoted by Paul in Romans, in Romans 3, absolutely, and he quotes them with approval. But I do get this slight suspicion, and it's only a 1% or 2% suspicion, that David is saying, yes, I've sinned, and I, yes, I'm very sorry, but this actually is going to uh, justify you, God. It's it's all to your, you know, it's all to your your side sort of thing. You're you're going to be made righteous out of this. You're going to be glorified out of this. And yes, this is why Paul quotes it, but I'm just wondering whether there is not a 1% in all this where David is trying to make the best out of a pretty bad job, a bad situation. Well, yes, Paul does quote it. And he quotes it in the context of trying to prove to people that we really will be saved by grace and that when it comes to Israel, God's people, God has not forgotten. And that in the end, all Israel shall be saved and God's grace is going to be amazing. And he speaks in Romans as if God is put in the dock, as if God is taken to court by people who doubt his grace, by people who are saying, can you really save me after all I have done? Can you really save Israel after all they have done? They killed your son. Is your grace enough for me? I do not have many righteous works. I have a lot of sin. How could you save me? And Paul is arguing that by those arguments, you are putting God in the dock. Yes, you have sinned, absolutely. But that when God justifies you by grace, he shall be proved right. He shall be justified. He shall be made righteous by his salvation of you, despite you being such a sinner. And so it works out that human sin glorifies God. Because every time God forgives, he counts somebody as righteous, and his righteousness is made greater. So you love that about God, that he doesn't let human sin defeat him, but he works with it. <clears throat> well, 
as I say, he he does say, you know, I, I've sinned in your sight. And the prodigal son, who is each one of us, says, I have sinned in your sight. So the prodigal son, yeah, is every one of us. And in the mouth of the prodigal son are put the very words of David. I have sinned in your sight, Father. And so, you know, really and truly, he is every one of us. This is not reading some random story of adultery and, you know, murder and so forth. This is every one of us. So then, <clears throat> going uh, further, he, verse 5, he seems again, in my opinion, to make the same possible 1 or 2% mistake. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. And uh, brought forth there in, in the English, in the uh, King James, is I was shapen, I was shaped. And the word literally means to, to, to twine, to, um, to twist, to, to twist me. I was twisted around in my mother's womb in iniquity. And often that word does have the sense of moral kind of twisting perversion. What are we to make of this verse 5? I mean, the Roman Catholics and people who follow Luther believing in original sin would say, oh, yeah, every time a woman conceives, God's like, oh, dang, there's another horrible child being conceived. How I hate that fetus. It's all sin inside that person. Oh, whoops, the thing's been born. Oh, covered in sin. Oh, he's going to spend his life sinning and making me angry. Well, that's what classical, you know, Christianity believes. That we're all, you know, man is hopelessly evil and sinful. And this verse is, is quoted. Uh, I don't agree with that because there's a mass of other Bible verses that teach otherwise, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are made in the image and likeness of God. That's why James says, don't curse another human being because he's made in the image and likeness of God. And the Lord Jesus had our nature. He was also conceived of an ordinary woman. Mary was an ordinary woman. He was conceived in her womb. And Yet he was holy, harmless, and undefiled. I'm quoting Paul in Hebrews. So I don't think it is a sin to be human. And as I say, Protestants and Catholics, they all got this idea. It's a very common idea. And <clears throat> what therefore does he mean? I think that because he sinned, and he realizes he sinned, he comes to the quite correct realisation that, you know what, I'm rotten through and through. I've had that. You think you repent of a sin and then you you think wider and you think, you know what, I'm just, I'm rotten through and through. <laughs> I didn't just make one mistake. My whole life is not that I'm, you know, sort of hard set, hardcore to do evil, um, but <clears throat> I'm just so weak in every department. I'm sinful right the way through and I've been all my life. And so, yes, it is quite right that he and we should feel like this. But, as I say, I don't think he's, if what he means here is, <clears throat> well, I was brought forth, or I was shapen, I was twisted together in iniquity. When I was a fetus, and I, those cells came together inside my mother's womb. Ah, it was all in sin. Ah, oh, no surprises that I committed adultery, committed murder. No surprises, poor me. No, David, you didn't have to commit adultery. You didn't have to commit murder. You didn't have to lie. You didn't have to do what you did. Stop blaming it on your humanity. The Lord Jesus had human nature. And that, that's huge because he showed what is possible within human nature. That human nature is not... I mean, it's a big factor, but it does not mean I am an inevitable sinner. No one is an inevitable sinner. We hang our heads over every sin. So what does he mean when he says, in sin did my mother conceive me? As I say, if you want to go with a standard Protestant Catholic view that oh, yeah, human conception is a sin, 
well, I think that's wrong. I don't think it is. It's, it cannot sh surely be a, a sin for a woman to conceive. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about the act of conception. That's, that's not a sin to have a kid. Surely not. Um, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus loved little children. So I, if that's what he's saying, well, he's wrong. Uh, with respect, all due respect to you, David. And even if you were right, you committed adultery. You committed mass murder, mate. You despise the word of Yahweh. And don't start coming out with something about, ah, yeah, well, yeah, you see, my mum was a sinner. Or I was conceived in the womb. I was a sinner when I was conceived. Well, nothing to do with it. I don't actually think that is what he means. I think it means what it says. In sin, my mother conceived me. Well, if you said that today, <clears throat> if you said to me, ah, oh, you know, my mum, uh, my mum, bless her, she conceived me in sin. Oh, I would assume you mean, well, yeah, well, mum had a fling, you see, she had a fling and, well, you know, I was the result thereof. Yeah, that's, what it, that's what it says, that's what I think he's saying. And, of course, that's why <clears throat> when Samuel comes to Jesse, his father, and says, um, where's your sons? Oh, here they are, blah, blah, blah. No, he says none of them are any good um, to anoint. Uh, have you got any others? Jesse's like, ah, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, well, there's David. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, out in the field. Um, and that would explain why, as David says, I was a stranger to my brethren. His brothers said, uh, yeah, you're technically our brother, your half-brother. Yeah, mum had a fling. Well, all right. Bless her, dear old mum. And I think he's, that's what he's saying. <clears throat> I'm illegitimate. In sin, my mother conceived me. She had a fling. Well, so it was. Why say that, David? Well, on one hand, you can say that, yeah, because you're convicted of your sin in one area, you do start looking at your whole life and the life of everybody, and you think, ah, oh, we are terrible sinners. Absolutely correct. But <clears throat> I cannot resist just wondering whether David is not thinking, well, all right, so I committed adultery with Bathsheba. I'm very sorry about it, but uh, dear old mum... Dear old mum, bless her. Bless her, dear old mum. <clears throat> she did the same. Dear old mum, bless her. I can't, just can't stop myself from thinking there's a bit of that in there. Well, <clears throat> be that as it may, he goes on to say, verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place, in the hidden place. So you desire or you love truth in the inward parts. What is truth? For, for David, in his innermost hidden heart, he now knew that there God sees me. You, God, see me, as Hagar said. And me trying to cover my sin and, and cover it up with, trying to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba to cover the pregnancy and all that. No, no. I really have sinned. But, you know, I really believe that although I ought to die, I really believe that you have forgiven me and restored to me the joy of your salvation, as he's going to say. I believe in you, God. I believe in your love. I believe in your mercy. So much that I can even rejoice, even in my awful situation, I can rejoice that I'm going to be saved. But that conviction was in his innermost parts. Now that is what truth is. The truth has become a code name for the set of doctrines in your community and the things to do with your community. My dear dad used to give a lecture, a talk um, called The History of the Truth, in recent times, and all this kind of thing. And what he meant was the history of his denomination and all their various quirks and fo foibles and so on. God wants truth, and he, he wants to find truth in your inward part. He's not looking for a list of theological doctrinal propositions called the truth, but the final truth that he looks for. The final truth is 
Have you deeply confessed your sin? And do you believe in my love, in your inward parts, in your hidden part? And if you do, then I'll be teaching you wisdom in that inner part. Do you believe right deep inside you that I see you? And that there's no secret sins. It's all open. It's all open to me. That is what God desires. That's what he loves. That is the truth to live by. And unfortunately, the idea is that in many, many, certainly small-time Protestant groups, the idea is that you have to discern and understand certain doctrinal truths on an intellectual level and hold on to those understandings and that's it. This is not a truth to live by. The truth is that you and me know in our innermost heart of hearts, our hidden part, that I am a sinner. You, God, see me, but you, God, love me and have cleansed me, and I really will be saved. That is the truth to live by. It absolutely is. Well, <clears throat> as he's going to say, you want a broken and a contrite heart. And it is, as I say, that inner self. So you teach me wisdom, he says, in the innermost place or in the hidden place, um, in the secret heart. That, that word innermost place there is this uh, batuhot, which um, is related to the Egyptian word Thoth, which was the Egyptian god of the secret heart. So he's saying you in my most secret heart will teach me wisdom. And of course, you see how God can operate like a heart surgeon, surgeon doing open heart surgery on your innermost psychology. Absolutely. Purify me, verse 7, with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Now, this word for uh, purge or purify, it, it is actually the word chapa, which is like to sin. Uh, and it literally means to de-sin or to unsin. Unsin me. De-sin me. Well, as I say, this is different to any human concept of forgiveness. You can't de-sin me. If you do something bad to me and I like, forgive you, I can't unsin you. I can't de-sin you. I'll leave you to God, I'm afraid. Of, you have to sort that out with him. I can't, I can't do any more than that. But you see, God can. And this again is alluded to by John in the New Testament. The blood of Jesus, his son, which is sprinkled with hyssop, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And in these verses here, he talks about sin, iniquity, and transgression. He uses three Hebrew words, the, the three Hebrew words for basically sin. And they all got their different nuance. And we won't go into that, apart from to say that sin in all its nuances, in all its dimensions, be it sin, iniquity, transgression, however you want to finally define these things, the whole thing has been dealt with. The blood of Jesus, his son, that we, well, quite rightly remember in the bread and wine, in the cup. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin, not just from sin, all sin, sin in all its ways. And we can be unsinned by God. David, to his credit, is mature enough spiritually to get this. Now, Paul talks about this in the New Testament, where he he says that the blood of the Lord Jesus can cleanse our conscience. He says the blood of the animals, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do that. But the blood of the Lord Jesus can cleanse our conscience to serve the living God. Now, what does that mean? There is no, again, as Paul says, no more consciousness of sin. He can obliterate it in a way that only God can. He can unsin you, de-sin you. He can take it away and deal with it. Now, no other god could do that. The gods of the surrounding nations, the idea was if you did something wrong to them, you must appease them so that they overlooked what you did 
and they kept on blessing you materially with good harvests or whatever. But Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the only God who can unsin you, who can obliterate that sin, who can, in that sense, rewrite your history spiritually. The physical history is still there, but spiritually, that history can be rewritten. And again, you are made whiter than snow, not rinsed, but trodden out till the stain is gone. Not cosmetic rinsing and washing. Oh, let me just get that off my jumper. Oh, it looks all right. You won't see it, will you? Now, I spilt my uh, bit of my Big Mac sauce from McDonald's yesterday. Oh, you, I got it off. You won't see it. It's still there a little bit. Um, no, this is deep cleansing, the treading out. And again, the garments of the Lord Jesus, whiter than any filler on earth could wipe them. And so likewise, no amount of psychotherapy can obliterate sin, no amount of rationalization, self-understanding, sort of stuff some prison psychologists do with prisoners who've done bad things. None of that can obliterate sin, but God can. <clears throat> this is the God with whom we have to do. So he says, verse 9, hide your face from my sins. Now, he recognizes, I have sinned, as for he says, I have sinned in your sight. I've sinned before your face, but please hide your face now from my sin. Um, <clears throat> and he says in many of his Psalms, don't hide your face from me. But hide your face, he says, from my sins. So he's seeing a difference between my sins and me. Hide your face from my sins. You've seen them, you've looked at them, please don't look anymore, get rid of them, but please keep looking at me. And that's right, because, as we're going to read, verse 10, create in me a clean heart. God looks at your better side, he looks at that heart right within you, and he will turn away from looking at your sins. Well, of course, David is absolutely right to ask for this total obliteration of sin. Absolutely. But again, I have a 1% or whatever, a 1% doubt about David in this. And it's this, that he wants the sin obliterated because I think he doesn't like the sound of what Nathan said, who basically said, all right, David, you're not going to die, but you're going to suffer big consequence for this in your family for the rest of your life. Uh, he, he he thought that his family, his house, was going to, you know, last forever. And he misunderstood willfully the promise of God that when you are dead, after you sleep with your fathers, one of your messianic descendants, your one great messianic descendant, will be my son and your son. He is going to build a house of people for me. Not you, but me through him. And so when God says your own house, your own family is going to destroy you and destroy themselves by the same things of adultery and murder that you committed, well, he doesn't like that. So I just have this 1% doubt that it, of concern that his desire for this total obliteration of my sin sort of also meant, yeah, well, if it's obliterated, no consequence, God, right? That scribbles the consequences as well if the sin is scribbled. I just wonder whether there was that in it. So, <clears throat> blot out again, he says, verse 9, all my iniquities. But you see, later on in Psalm 109, this is quite a few years later, at the time of Absalom's rebellion, he says, God, may the sins of my enemies never be blotted out. Yeah, he said, oh, God, blot out my sins. But then years later, he's going to say, God, never blot out their sins. And he tells Solomon, his son, he basically gives him a hit list. He said, look, when I'm dead and gone, Shimei, the old bloke there with the white hair, get that white hair with his blood on it down on the grave. Right, son? Oh, yes, dad, I'll do that for you. No, he doesn't hold this intensity that he's got here to the end. Then verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. <clears throat> Don't throw me out of your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a, a free spirit or 
your free spirit or a willing spirit. All these are saying the same thing. He's saying, create in me a clean heart. He doesn't say, you know, slightly alter, slightly amend my existing heart. He says, create in me a new heart, a clean heart. With a right spirit, put your spirit in me, your Holy Spirit. So effectively, we have two hearts. You have the heart of the flesh, which is as is, and you have a new heart. The difference between us and, say, the unbeliever next door is that that unbeliever doesn't have this other heart. All they have is the heart of the flesh, a bit of conscience. We have, yes, the heart of the flesh, but we have this new heart. And that is what Paul talks about when he talks about flesh and spirit. And he says the two fight against each other. And I find that when I, I, I myself, my clean heart, my good heart, when I want to do good, you know, the, the mind of the flesh it keeps attacking me and stopping me. It's very frustrating. But you see, this is the wonder of this psalm, that in your hidden part, in your inward part, this is the clean heart. The heart that is cleansed, the heart that knows that I have sinned, but God has renewed me. Definitely this verse is quoted by Paul in Titus 3 when he says, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, like David's saying, there's no sacrifice for me to offer. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what he is talking about here from verse 10 onwards. Create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, take not your Holy Spirit from me, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. This is what he's talking about. And this is the Old Testament's equivalent of what Paul calls a new creation. A new heart is created. And in fact, the new covenant is all about the gift of this new heart in Ezekiel 36. This is the work of the Spirit. And you see how even in the Old Testament, it was possible and David experienced it. What he's writing here is almost New Testament stuff about the work of the Holy Spirit in the human heart. But now, far more intensely and more powerfully, because the Lord Jesus has died, his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus, is poured out even more intensely into human hearts. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. This is why I beg people to get baptized, so that they might receive this gift, not speaking in tongues, miracles, other stuff. This new heart, this, as, as he says, renew, refresh a right spirit within me. And, you know, he says, my youth, he says, it feels like it's been renewed like the eagles. My soul is restored, he says in other Psalms. This is what Paul says when he says, when you're baptized, you walk in newness of life. But we all wonder. We think, yes, I, I see what you're saying, and I do at times feel this, uh, but. Yeah. That but is because, yes, you've got this new heart that God has created in you, this heart for him, this heart that recognizes sin and rejoices in God's forgiveness. But you have still got the heart of the flesh. That will not be taken away until the Lord comes. Even Paul had it, and the two fight each other. So don't beat yourself up that, oh, well, yeah, I know what you mean about being short of salvation, but you see I have this, <clears throat> you see I've got these sins and I doubt Yes, of course. That's the flesh. Yeah, sure, the flesh does. Yeah, yeah. But identify with who you really are. Your clean heart that God has created in you. Your heart for him, the spirit, as New Testament calls it. And, you know, people live day by day, most people, sort of crisis mentality, survival mode. Got to work. Got to deal with the kids. 
got this problem with the neighbours, with my relationships, with my wife and my kids, with my husband. Got all these issues with my parents, with my kid, with my neighbour, whatever. People live in survival mode, most people, day by day. Even people who got money and are retired and live in the dream. Little things to us becomes huge for them. And they're the same. Oh, I'm struggling over this issue. Oh, struggling over that. <clears throat> That's always how it is. Don't let that be get on top of you. That is how it is. Oh, and I haven't been saving for my retirement. Oh, whoops. I'm getting older. What am I going to do? Oh, my health's starting to pack up. Yeah. Yes. All that is as is. But in your core, heart of hearts, I have the joy of your salvation. I've got your spirit of freedom. You know, let's say verse 10 to 12 is the picture of what it is to have the Holy Spirit. A new clean heart created in me, a renewed spirit, your presence, God's presence and his spirit are the same pretty well. That's why the comforter is all about the, the presence of, of God. Um, you know, Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? This sense of the presence of God. 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That I know that I will be saved if the Lord comes now, if I die now. I am going to live forever in God's kingdom. Wow, I rejoice. Uphold me with your free spirit or with a willing spirit. A desire to, to do your will. You know, as Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, this is 2 Corinthians 3, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. But as I was saying, most people live most of their lives in survival mentality, in crisis mentality, in survival mentality. I'm just putting one, forward, one foot in front of the other forward, day by day. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's about it. Yeah, with the kids and money, and health, relationships. It's just crisis mentality. And just survival. Survival mentality. Endurance. Gritting your teeth. And that which cannot be avoided must be endured. As our mothers probably told us. And, yeah. As I say, I don't have any answers to all those issues. They're there in my life, your life, every human being's life. But in the real me and in the real you, there is this clean heart that God has created that is upheld with his free spirit where the spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. Your Holy Spirit, your presence, the joy of your salvation. Wow. So it makes all the difference. And then he says, verse 13, then will I teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted unto you. It's as if he's saying, hmm, um, when, when I'm forgiven, I'm going to go on a mass campaign to tell sinners not to do what I did. You could argue that Psalm 32, which is a masculine teaching psalm, was sort of doing that by way of him writing the psalm. But quite honestly, I would have expected, given what he did, for him to gather all Israel together unto him to Jerusalem. And he says, listen, all Israel, hear, O Israel, I, David, your king, have sinned in such and such a way, but I have been forgiven. And I want to beg you on my hands and knees to forgive me, to accept me still as your king. And I beg earnestly that you will, ex will receive God's grace as I have received it. God bless you. I would have expected that. I'd be a lot happier. But it's none of that. Instead, the opposite. He doesn't really discipline his own sons for murder and adultery. His kingdom collapses, really, into issues related to murder and adultery. And all he does in his later psalms is criticize sinners. Well, you know, may your sins never be blotted out instead of may you be converted. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. 
Mm. Oh, God, you God of my salvation. What does he mean by blood guiltiness? It's suspicious to me that he doesn't mean, well, I suspect he means, yeah, forgive me and save me from the consequence. I mean, he murdered Uriah and those other soldiers, and really, the relatives of Uriah and the other soldiers could kill him. And he said, oh, save me from all that. Save me from the consequence. Instead of like, well, whatever consequence there is if I die, well, that's absolutely just. Verse 16, yeah, you desire not sacrifice, else will I give it. The sacrifices of God, verse 17, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Yeah, absolutely. But he, David, had despised the word of the Lord. And again, it is almost as if he is using the fact that oh, I've got a very broken heart as a kind of bargaining chip. Well, therefore, you won't despise me, God, will you? I know I despise you, um, but you won't despise me because yeah, I've got this broken heart. I know he did have a broken heart, and that's wonderful. And in that inner heart, that core you, there is, there has to be a broken heart, a broken spirit. But it's a broken spirit, but also filled with your Holy Spirit. So you see, in that inner heart, there is... You know, where the spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. But the heart is broken and contrite, but it's free. Then the last two verses, oh, uh, do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. Then they will offer bullocks upon your altar. Well, you could say that he said in verse 16, you don't want sacrifice, you want a broken heart. So maybe he means that, well, one day in Jerusalem, they will offer sacrifices, but with the right attitude. Maybe. But I, I find, to be honest, these verses a bit sad because Zion was David's personal house, his personal citadel, and he wanted to build a temple there. And God had said, no, I don't want the temple. I want to dwell in the hearts of people. And you shall not build me a house. One day you will have a descendant who will be my son, the Lord Jesus, as we know. And I will build up his house in the sense of people. But as we know, David ignores that, focuses on his own family and tries to set Solomon up to build a physical temple in Zion, David's own private citadel, his, his estate. And when Solomon does that, you can read it in 1 Kings 3, it actually says, yes, he built the temple and the walls around Jerusalem, as if that was also part of his father's vision. So at the end of all this, all this contrition, brokenheartedness, he still... Back to his old thing about, oh, well, one day, you know, Zion and the temple will be built and sacrifices will be offered again. He just said in verse 17, I know you don't want sacrifices. 16, 17, I know you don't want sacrifice. You want a broken heart. But, well, one day, build up the temple, build the walls of Jerusalem, just as I dreamed. God had said, I don't want all that building. Uh, but, oh, no, he wanted to do it. And then, oh, yes, there'll be sacrifices offered. And looking at the, the force of the word, the word then in verse 19, it seems to be saying, once the walls of Jerusalem are built, once my temple is built, then, because of the temple, you will be satisfied and pleased with the sacrifices offered. That's irrelevant. You know, Solomon clearly read it that way because he builds a temple and says, oh, great, God, now we've built a temple, now you will accept our sacrifice. No. He's just said in verse 16 and 17, oh, I've got a broken heart. You want my broken heart, Lord. You know, one sacrifice. So it goes back to this old narrative that he's got. And it's because I think that he unfortunately had that attitude. That he's, he, he was very good in his contrition, but I think that there were these elements of whatever, insincerity, narratives, agendas, I'm afraid down the years he didn't stay humble 
and he starts to condemn other people and make himself out to be poor innocent me. I was unfairly persecuted. I'm unfairly suffering. No, you're, you're not unfairly suffering, mate. You, you deserved it, and you deserve death. So we come then to the cup and to the bread, and it is because of the Lord's death that we can be super cleansed, cleansed even in our conscience, not just forgiven, but washed whiter than snow, not rinsing your jumper in the washing machine, but treading the thing out, the stain removed. Obliteration of sin and the creation in us of a new heart where there is the Holy Spirit, a heart that is broken, but a heart where there is God's Spirit, where there is the joy of salvation, and where there is the Spirit of the Lord that makes the heart free, even though it's broken, even though it's crushed, even though it's contrite. And that is the real you, the real me, despite, as I say, the way human beings live their lives in a chaotic survival mentality, crisis mentality, crisis mode, day by day. Oh, so, so, so you do. But the heart that he has created is free radically from all that. So then the bread represents the Lord's body. And it is through him, you know, through him having clothes whiter than any filler on earth can whiten them, that we can be counted righteous. So then, let's give thanks for the uh, for the bread. Um, uh, then, Mui, are you in a spot where you can uh, give thanks for the bread? <clears throat> let's give thanks for the bread. Our dearest Father in heaven, we are thanking you and praising you and being so delightful in the reality of your presence. Father, we're here meditating and pondering over the manifestation of your grace in Jesus, our Lord. We thank you, Father, for inviting us to a true and lasting relationship with your Son, and to see and experience your grace in all its richness in your Son, so that we may look upon him and focus on him, knowing that in him and through him, we became the recipients of your mercy and your grace. Father, this is another way of showing our deep appreciation and acceptance of your undeserved kindness. And with this bread, insignificant it may seem, but to us, it represents his perfect body, his humbleness and obedience, his perfect life, and through his sacrifice gave great blessing to us all. Father, we recognize that you owe us nothing but judgment but you've shown us mercy and pride and grace and that you have cleansed us, you remembered us and understanding our human limitation, our imperfections and impurities in all our daily lives. But you have dealt with all of that and we are so grateful. Please, Father, strengthen us and help us to draw our strength from the fact that we are living in the newness of life in Christ our Lord. We live because of him living in us. We eat this bread remembering your salvation that comes through the humility and the obedience of your son to the glory of you, our Father and our Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. So this bread represents the Lord Jesus' his body and our very grateful part in him. Um, could I ask, um, 
of uh, the Hazel, would you like to give thanks for the cup? And uh, Phil Martin, would you like to close with prayer? Okay. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this cup of wine, the symbol of the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the new covenant in his blood, that our Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was resurrected on the third day, and you raised him to eternal life. And this is the eternal life you have given to us in your Son. We thank you for your great mercy and your love for all of us who are really unworthy. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we say this prayer with thanksgiving. Amen. So the blood of the Lord Jesus can cleanse us, cleanse our conscience, make your dirty clothes, our stains, whiter than white because of him. Well, Phil, would you like to conclude with a word of prayer? Surely. Our Father in heaven, we've had brought to our notice once again your great mercy, your great love, and our great need to recognise that we need a contrite heart. We need to have a broken heart, which you will then repair by rebuilding it and filling it with your Holy Spirit. How can we thank you enough for that, dear God? We cannot, but we just ask for your help to build us up, to maintain our faith. And we, of course, give thanks to the Lord Jesus through whom this has all been made possible. Without him, without his sacrifice, human beings would be dead, dead and gone. But that's not your purpose. Your purpose is life and light forevermore. So we ask for your blessing, please, on all your children, all of us here on Zoom and all around the world, wherever they are. You know who they are. We won't know perhaps even many of who they are. But please be with us all in, in the coming days. For those who are travelling, please give them safety. And may we all abide in your love and seek to do your will and be a help to those around us. For we ask all these things now, giving you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our King. Amen. Amen.